All right. So uh, picking up where we left off with development, uh, with the, um, I'm sorry, uh, developmental psychology, I almost said lifespan development, basically the same thing. Um, but developmental psychology looks more at the formative years of children. So uh, from conception all the way up through um, uh, through through early childhood. Now, lifespan development goes from conception all the way to death, you know, what we call cradle to death. Cradle is a little misleading. But um, anyway, so it goes through the transitions that people go through, because we go through different milestones. We go through um, different stages of life. And as we get a little bit older, you know, we start to realize, we start to come to grips with our own mortality uh, and our own limitations, um, which guides different behaviors. Like how many of you right now have ideas that you're going to be millionaires by the time you're 40 or 50 years old. Anybody? Yeah. 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 I, I remember thinking the same thing. I, I'm still not discounting it. You know, I couldn't win the lottery or uh, open some kind of successful business. Uh, but for the most part, um, I'm not, uh, when you get to a little bit of an older age, you start to realize the reality sets in um, that you have limited time to do things and limited resources and capabilities to do things. And it, it sounds very droll and it sounds very, um, uh, what do I want to say, depressing, I guess, right? But it's just what reality is. You come to grips with your reality. Things aren't as fantastical as they used to be. So with that realization comes different. Uh, behaviors and different ways of, of settling your life down, settling your body down. Some people want to have children. Uh, some people may want to travel the world. You know, it varies depending on what those person, uh, what that person's individual goals are. So anyway, lifespan development kind of covers in broad strokes. It covers uh, what those transitions look like. And I apologize. You see, we just got a fire alarm. Um, so I apologize. I'm going to leave this running. I do have to evacuate. Uh, so I'm going to leave this running and uh, pick up where we left off. Sorry, folks. All right. So anyway, um, yeah, with developmental psychology, we just look at how people develop, not only physically, but we want to see how they uh, develop cognitively as in how they think and, and uh, intelligence levels. And we also want to see how they develop socially because socialization is, is very important. How they develop their communication skills and their ability to interact with others, either through relationships or through whatever means, um, you know, that's really important because not only do we build those relationships, but we learn from them too, which uh, also builds us cognitively. And we're going to talk a little bit about that today with Eric Erickson's uh, psychosocial development, among uh, other theorists, uh, theorists in, in that realm. Uh, so I'm going to share my screen with you again. Um, so psychosocial development is just as it sounds. It has, has to do with not only psychological, but social uh, components as well, because they're very much intertwined, especially in the developmental realm. So um, looking at how we are raised, there are some biological components to that. One of those is uh, we call temperament, okay? So temperament is, is a uh, behavioral characteristics that's established at birth. Uh, a lot of indications show that it, uh, it is biological, it is genetic, and it is hereditary. So uh, you could have two parents that might have heightened anxiety. They might be a little bit more difficult uh, as, as children themselves, and they grow up um, and have ch kids of their own, uh, chances are they're going to pass that, uh, that hereditary gene on to kids, uh, their, their kids. Um, and the interesting thing with temperament is that all kids can be different. So even given everything, uh, all things being equal, you have the exact same household, the exact same parents, the exact same geolocation, uh, geographical location, and you could have very different kids. You, you could have one child that is easy, another child that is difficult, another one that is slow to warm up. Um, with the, the explanations for each of these, we have easy children. What, what would an easy child look like in your, your opinion? Like how many of you have seen kids and what do easy children look like? The characteristics wise. What are their behaviors? They don't really cry that much. Um, they're like fun to be around. Um, 
they are like easygoing. Um, you know, you if they start to cry, you give them a bottle and then they stop. Yeah. Yeah. They're not too fussy. They don't get agitated too easily. Right. Um, uh, they sleep well through the night. Uh, the, I, I remember my fir uh, first two oldest, uh, uh, my, my son and my daughter, uh, they were both, I mean, I just hear horror stories about people that have, you know, they're up all night with their kids and that happened on rare occasion with mine, but for the most part, uh, they just slept, I mean, 14 hours a night, no problem. And then they wake up and they get a little fussy when they wanted food, but never had any uh, really temperament problems. My, my third child, um, he was, he came out a little bit later. He was a little more fussy. He didn't sleep. He, he had, we had a lot of late nights with him. But anyway, that just, that's a testament that, uh, that, that, that uh, kids are a little bit different. Uh, so anyway, easy is uh, less fussy. Difficult is um, almost constantly like in, it, it's almost like they're constantly angry or upset or frustrated. And they, that is marked by uh, kids that cry a lot, right? They always want to be fed. They always want to be held. They uh, don't sleep through the night very well, right? Um, and then you have your third type, which is slow to warm up. So we, with temperament, we have stranger anxiety, which I think we'll talk about here in, in a couple other slides. But uh, stranger anxiety, if there's a new, uh, so, so these tend to be children that are seemingly easygoing when everything is in order, everything is in routine. Uh, but if something breaks that routine, that tends to be very difficult for them. So if they're not fed at the exact same time, or if there's a new face in the family, it may be hard for them to uh, warm up to them uh, to, to the point where they can, they can be comfortable and less fussy. So those are really the three temperaments that your book describes. Um, attachment theory. So um, Ainsworth, um, as I, I described, came up with the, with the strange situation. So this is where they remove the, the parents' um, from from the child's view and the, the child's nurturing and reintroduce them or they'll leave them away for a little bit and bring in a stranger or something like that. So anyway, uh, Ainsworth described this as attachment. And that is basically the bond between an infant and caregiver, which is very, very necessary. Like I said, I mean, we are uh, we are a social being, we are social animals, and we need that interaction with others because we depend on others. So attachment uh, does two things. It, it allows for the child to be cared for, um, and it also, uh, it, it also builds them up as far as uh, their ability to connect with other people. Um, so there are two things going on, a bond with their caregiver, and breaking away to socialize with other people. So strong attachments to a caregiver um, is good. You know, we want that, but there might be too much of a, of a bond there that if they break away, they might uh, become anxious and, and unsafe. Um, what, what, why would that be a problem? Why would too much of a strong bond with a caregiver be a problem, do you think? Because like when it comes time to leave the house, the kid might not want to leave and they just don't know how to do anything like by themselves or without their parents. Absolutely. Because we're talking about that lifespan, we look at parents, they have their own trajectory. They have their own changes that they're going to go through. And most parents, I'm not going to say all parents, but most parents get to that point where they want independence from their child, right? They don't want their their, uh, their, their child being 40 years old and, and playing video games in the basement, right? That's not uh, uh, an ideal situation for most parents. You know, some parents want that and some children are welcoming of that. Um, yeah, and I don't judge either way, but for the, for the most part, in order to gain independence, and we all have that drive to do that, uh, most of us have that drive to do that, um, would require having healthy attachments, not only with the caregivers, but with other people as well. So the four attachment styles that Ainsworth had talked about was secure, avoidant, ambivalent, and disorganized or disoriented infants. Okay. So I'll, uh, let's see if we go through these. No, we don't. Okay. Um, so with, uh, with the attachment styles, we, we have the secure infants, 
which are children that uh, feel safe and secure with their caregivers, okay? So when the caregivers go away, they might be a little fussy at first, but for the most part, they're they're within uh, within somewhat normal tolerance of what anxiety would be for, for children uh, in a new situation, okay? Uh, but within that, that relationship, you'll see children that are willing to go out and explore, you know, uh, explore their neighborhood, explore their house, because they feel that they have that security when they want it and when they need it, okay? Um, and that's what we consider uh, secure infants. Avoidant infants are uh, usually children that, uh, uh, that avoid their, their caregiver. So if their caregiver is there, they tend to um, uh, be avoidant of, uh, of their affection, right? And that happens in, in some cases where uh, either the, the child just is uh, too fussy or, um, or something like that, right? And then you have ambivalent uh, infants who just generally have no reaction either way, either parent is there or parent is not there. Um, they don't care either way. And then you have the disorganized and disoriented infants. Now I will say for this one, we tend to see this a lot in, in abuse cases, right? Or neglect cases. So we'll see a, a child that is off the charts, just, you know, just screaming and yelling while the parent is there. And when they go away, they may be calm or they may also be screaming and yelling. So the, you usually just see very discontent and very confusing behaviors with disorganized and disoriented uh, infants, okay? Um, so with the Harlow's Monkeys trials, uh, I don't believe, have we, have we watched the, the videos for Harlow's Monkey trials? I don't think we did for this class yet. Um, I usually introduce them a couple times, but let me see if I have them in here and we'll just, uh, oh. Where do I have monkeys and morality crash course? No, that's not what I want. All right, let me uh, let me play this video for you. Now here are 106's two mothers. As you can see, it was weaned on a wire mother. Here's baby 106. Watch. He's going to the wire mother. He's got to eat to live. Going back. He's back on the cloth mother and he'll stay on the cloth mother. Actually, this baby spends his 17 to 18 hours a day on the cloth mother and less than one hour a day on the wire mother. We had predicted that the variable of contact comfort would be a variable of measurable importance, but we were unprepared to find that it completely overwhelmed and overshadowed all other variables, including those of nursing. Frankly, doctor, if it comes to a choice between wire and cloth, it's reasonable to expect that any child will go to the cloth. It's a matter of creature comfort, like a baby with its blanket. But is this really love? Well, what do you mean by saying that a baby loves its mother? Certainly one thing we mean is that it gets a great feeling of security in the presence of the mother. Now, Mr. Collingwood, wouldn't you say that if you frightened a baby, that it went running to its mother, was comforted, and then all the fear disappeared and was replaced by a complete sense of security that that baby loved its mother? Now, in this experiment, this is the apparatus we use.
That looks diabolical. That's just the way the baby monkey feels about it. Flashing eyes, loud sound, moving mechanical parts, all of these things are designed to frighten a monkey. Now, here we have a peaceful, resting baby monkey. Let's find out what his reactions to his mother are when we frighten him. what any child will do in a similar situation. He runs away. It's more than running away. He was running to his mother to touch her, to drive away his fear. Contact with the mother changes his entire personality. Look, now he's actually threatening the diabolical object. All right, this gives us part of the picture of the strength of infantile love. This is a six-foot square room with a few toys and other objects. But to the monkey, it's much more menacing. We know that when our own children are taken to a strange place without their mothers, they are often overwhelmed with fear. This room is just such a new and strange environment for the baby monkeys. No mother is in there. Now, let's put a monkey into the room. Notice how cautiously he enters the room. He's searching for comfort, but nothing relieves his disturbance. Now we'll take the baby monkey out and put in a wire mother. Now this one was nursed by a wire mother. That's right, all his life. She doesn't seem to help much. Now we'll try the same test with a cloth mother in the room. You see the contrast in the behavior? Despite the fact that the wire mother nursed him, she could offer this infant nothing in the way of affection or security. But here the monkey, by rubbing against the cloth mother, as if he were seeking as much contact comfort as he could get, builds up his reservoir of affection and security. First, his body relaxes as the fear disappears. But above and beyond this, new positive response patterns appear. He now goes out to explore and investigate this new strange world. He is now a normal, happy, curious baby. All right. Um, so I, I know that was a little bit of a dated video, um, but I mean, I think it really highlights the, the video came through, correct? Yeah. yeah I did. Okay. Yeah. All right. Um, so what'd y'all think? I, I, like I said, I know it's a, a very dated video, um, but I think it really highlights some important things as far as attachment. And they've replicated the study multiple times and they found very similar results. Uh, I don't, I haven't really found any videos that are much different than that. Uh, but anyway, uh, what does that tell you about attachment? I mean, what did you see, especially in that last seg segment when uh, that, that uh, child, when the monkey was introduced to a new environment and, and that secure attachment, what did you see happen? He was scared. He was scared if like the cloth mother wasn't there. Yeah, yeah. So when he had no 
attachment whatsoever and he was introduced to that new environment that uh, created a lot of panic and a lot of fear and a lot of hesitation to even explore anything in fact i don't think we saw him explore anything at all but when he built up i think the the, the scientists on there said build up his reserve of security uh, he was he felt like that place was a safe space for him to do that so uh just a kind of couple um you know get your your thoughts going here so uh what are some possible implications, would you say, for human mothers who feed their infants with bottles rather than breastfeeding? You guys have a, an opinion either way, which one's better or, or why? I think, I think that um, obviously like the monkey was showing, um, like he wants that attachment and connection to the mother. So like during breastfeeding, that is like a real connection. Mm -hmm between mother and child um but sometimes the child doesn't doesn't suckle doesn't nurse so it's right. um yeah it's it's interesting to mm -hmm. see if, if parents want to you know really try to enforce like try to get the baby to suckle or just kind of give up and and do formula so yeah yeah there there are a lot of fears it, it really there's there's just so many variables that go into this um, because we aren't necessarily like uh, 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 monkeys, where you know mothers of uh, of these monkeys, they they don't uh, they don't smoke, they don't drink, they don't do drugs, they don't take medication. There's nothing really. So their uh, breast milk is actually generally pretty pure, right? Um, humans a little bit different. We've got a lot of things going on. We have medical conditions. We have you know uh, all these things that are happening. Um, so how about, I'm going to ask this to maybe another person. Do you feel that somebody that is bottle fed is less adjusted, less, uh, well-adjusted than somebody who is breastfed? What do you think? Possibly because they don't have that connection with their mother as like someone who didn't take, or someone who did or didn't take formula did okay okay um yeah okay so so you uh, just kind of common sense logic there is if uh, somebody's breastfed then they would probably be better adjusted in life right anybody else have an opinion anybody quiet group today all right i think um yeah i think Breast, breastfeeding is the is the natural way um and yeah i think the babies have more connection with the with the mom and even even the mother to the baby um but like i said before sometimes the baby won't won't latch on so okay so sometimes the baby won't latch on what are some mm -hmm. other reasons why a, a mother uh, uh may not or a child may not be breastfed mm -hmm. The mom is working or has to go back to work. Um, maybe she doesn't have, sometimes in cases, I feel like some moms don't produce enough milk or, or they produce, I don't know. Can you produce bad milk? I don't know. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. You can produce yeah. bad milk. You can produce not enough milk or not nourishing enough milk. Yeah. Um, you know, stress hormones have, a, have a, a lot to do with that. You know, in a vacuum, in an ideal situation, if mother was healthy and baby was healthy and they were afforded that opportunity to, to have that bonding moment, yeah, it would be great, right? But that doesn't always happen. I'm not going to say it rarely happens. Uh, it never happens in a vacuum. Uh, it doesn't happen like in, in the wilderness where mom doesn't have any responsibilities and she can hang out all day and breastfeed her, her, uh, her pups, her children. Um, but uh, humans are a little bit of a different breed with that. So again, ideally, you know, the best nourishment, the, the best enzymes and, and hormones come from breast milk. However, um, that can't always happen. Mother uh, may be working, mother may be on, on some kind of drugs. They may not have, you know, they might be adopted. So they might have uh, a, a mother who's not producing or they might have uh, 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 same sex parents that, that can't uh, provide um, breastfeeding. 
So anyway, whatever that reason may be, it doesn't always happen that way. And, and uh, so we turn to like formula. Uh, we turn to alternative means to feeding children and which we're, science has shown is pretty close. You can still develop an attachment with a child without necessarily uh, breastfeeding them. So uh, the results are really inconclusive. You'll see a smattering of data out there, data points out there. Some people advocate saying that, yeah, uh, children that are breastfed are better well-adjusted than uh, children that are bottle fed. You know, I've seen it both ways. I don't think that the data is conclusive enough to say that one is over uh, better over the other because people that bottle feed can also be nurturing. They can also nourish their, their children. Um, so anyway, just, uh, just kind of food for thought there. So um, aside from attachment, uh, that kind of brings us into, you know, during, during the initial stages of life, um, a child develops what's called trust, right? And, and this kind of goes back to the anxious child or insecure or avoidant attachment styles. So if a child, or, or I'm sorry, disoriented, you know, disorganized attachment styles. If a child uh, cries, usually they expect something, right? They learn that immediately, that crying, uh, they cry usually because of biological reasons. There's some kind of discomfort going on. Their stomach is, is uh, ready to be fed or they don't feel well, or they might be colicky or, or something. You know, something is wrong that they, they need uh, something and they don't know how to communicate that. So crying is the only way that that happens. So earlier in life, when a child cries, they expect something to happen. And once that's satiated, they go back to good. They're not necessarily frightened anymore or sore or, or experience any kind of discomfort or anything anymore. So they, they build up this expectation. That expectation turns into trust. When I need something, I get it fulfilled, right? That's the, the mentality. And that uh, kind of propels us into what uh, a, a gentleman named Eric Erickson, um, who came after, you know, uh, after Jean Piaget and, and uh, started suggesting that in, it, he went beyond the age of adolescence. Because if you remember the four stages of cognitive development with Jean Piaget went to about adolescent age. Um, Eric Erickson expanded upon that and said, well, um, yeah, I mean, that's important to understand how children learn and children attach and they develop their cognitive abilities. However, I believe development goes way beyond that. And we're missing also a component called uh, social components, right? So we socialize. Our, our development is very much based on the interactions of others that we trust and around us, right? Which is the first stage uh, of his, is trust versus mistrust. So he developed these eight stages and we're going to go through them systematically here. Um, but stage one is trust versus mistrust. Stage two, autonomy versus shame. Stage three, initiative versus guilt. Stage four, industry versus inferiority. Uh, six is identity, identif identity versus role confusion. Six is intimacy versus isolation. Seven, gener generativity and stagnation. And eight, ego, integrity versus despair. And like I said, we're going to go through each one of these. Now, as we're doing this, I'm going to ask you all to keep a, 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 somebody in mind um, through each one of these stages, how they may have adjusted to these stages or maybe how they uh, have maybe stalled in one of these stages. OK, so, um, for example, if, if somebody uh, grew up with a turbulent lifestyle, they may have trust issues, right? They may be more on the mistrust side of things. And how does that stick for them, right? Now, this is somewhat stage dependent uh, a theory of uh, basically in order to get to the next stage, you have to successfully negotiate the other stage. Um, that's kind of true here, but not so much, if you know what I mean. So once somebody develops, whether they're, they're trusting of the world around them or mistrusting of the world around them, that is going to... Uh, kind of guide what their behaviors and their thought patterns are going to be when they get to the second stage, which is autonomy versus shame. So if we're going to see more to the right of mistrust, we might see that trickle down to the right of each one of these. So shame and then guilt and an inferiority and real confusion, all right? And that's not guaranteed. There are many components that have to happen for that to, that to occur. But for example, somebody could be mistrusting and still uh, gain a sense of autonomy. Okay, but usually we see uh, one thing leading to another uh, with these stages. All right, 
So uh, again, uh, and if you actually, if you all want to take a picture of that right now, take a screenshot because this is going to feed into our activity here in, in just a bit. Okay. Give me just a second. All right. So let's go through these by the numbers. Um, so his first stage, Erickson's first stage is trust versus mistrust. And similar to Jean Piaget's um, stages of development, I'm gonna use the same caveat, is that these are not hard and fast rules. Just because a child does not gain these skills at one years old, uh, a one year old does not necessarily mean that they're behind in any way. There's really, again, this is a theory, okay? So um, it, it, these are not hard and fast rules. They're, they're somewhat uh, loosely based on, on estimates. So about birth to one years old, uh, as we described, a child looks to have its basic needs met. Are they met consistently? If I communicate that I need something, and I'm kind of going to the mind of a child here, if I communicate that I need something, am I going to get it in a timely manner, right? Or am I going to cry and become more uncomfortable and experience discomfort and pains uh, or whatever um, and not know where that comfort or when that comfort's going to arrive? Right? So that's going to dictate whether or not they develop this sense of trust versus mistrust. Okay, So that's stage one. And after that, about one to three years, uh, a child may go into stage two, which is autonomy versus shame. And this is the, the stage where ch uh, toddlers realize that they can direct their own behavior. Right, Because uh, what happens around that age? Physically, what do, what are they start doing around that age? Growing, walking, right, um, talking, right, yeah, grabbing things, kind of commanding their environment. They're interacting with their environment as opposed to have uh, being dependent upon somebody to provide for them. So they develop that autonomy versus shame. Um, and and uh, if if they have direction, for example, you know, like I think we use the. Um, the example of potty training last last time, right? So, what are some things that, uh, like, some strategies as a parent that we would see to build up that autonomy? And what are some what are some behaviors of parents that might develop more of that shame aspect? Do you think? What what do how do parents develop this, either in a good way or bad way? What For example, it? like if they did something bad, they could either teach them that it's teach them that it's not the right way, or like punish them. Right, right. Uh, and as we learned back uh, during learning uh, our lectures on learning, that punishment is not always a great way to promote healthy behaviors, behaviors that we want. Right. It's usually to stop an unwanted behavior immediately. Um, but for the most part, we know that punishment is not a great teacher. So uh, parents that use punishment styles, such as maybe spankings uh, every time a child is not complying, uh, might not be the best way, right? It, in fact, it, uh, it, it teaches the child that violence is, uh, is likely to occur. Uh, parents that are overcritical or constantly involved might uh, also produce shame. Well, when I say constantly involved, constantly doing things for the child as opposed to letting them make their own mistakes and learning on their own, um, that, that might uh, produce some kind of criticism for that child. And they, they would think um, you know, they'd be more leaning towards the shame. Whereas uh, a, a parent that can work with a child and if they do something incorrect, they can maybe use language like, well, let's see if we can do that better. Or maybe just letting them discover whether or not it, it does work uh, or not. There's a thing I like to use in treatment uh, with parents and, and kiddos, uh, parents dealing with children behavior issues is picking your battles. Like if you have really, if, if you're, if a child is, uh, has some behavioral issues that are, um, that are uh, abnormal or, or deviant in some way, right? Deviant from normal. Um, working with parents to not pick apart every behavior of that child, you know, kind of giving them a little bit of space to make some wrong decisions is really important. Why is that? Why don't we want to criticize? Like if we have a child that's uh, misbehaving in some way, why do we want to kind of prioritize what behaviors we're going to uh, focus on versus ones we're just going to let go?
Does that make sense? Yeah. They like continuously do it and don't learn from the last time. Right, right, exactly. I, I had, um, I'll, I'll share with you one of, one of my, uh, my clients that was working with their child um, took away their Xbox over everything, every disagreement, every, uh, if he mouthed off to them or if he had a bad behavior, they took his Xbox for an indefinite amount of time with no uh, direction on when he was going to get that back. So what that what do you, what do you think that taught their their child? What is the danger in, in doing that? What what is a child learning? If he does anything wrong, then he gets a discipline. Well, not only discipline. Or, yeah, he gets huh? some, something taken away. Right. He he don't he not only gets stuff taken away. He gets the Xbox taken away, whether it's related to that or not. Um, so what that is producing in the child was kind of a blowback effect is that child now just thinks everything he does is wrong. And he just, it, and, and the uh, dynamic, he actually flipped it around in his mind and just kind of devalued the, the Xbox. So his behaviors were not connected with the Xbox whatsoever. They weren't relevant to him whatsoever. So whatever behaviors he did, he lost his Xbox and he just expected it to be gone. So the, the, the corrective action was not effective at all. So we had to kind of scale that back. And, and first of all, get the parents to not criticize and not punish every single behavior and, and allow for that Xbox to be valued again, because at that point, you know, it was gone and uh, all they kept doing was adding on more time. There, there was no connection there as to his actions versus uh, his consequences. So anyway, uh, over criticism, uh, over, go ahead. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, sorry. No, I was just saying, no, sorry. <laughs> okay. Uh, so uh, parents that are overcritical, uh, will produce more of that shame versus autonomy. Okay. All right. Initiative versus guilt. This happens around the age of three to five years old and when preschoolers are challenged to control their behavior, right? So um, how do they feel? Uh, are, they, are they actually interested in doing something that, that benefits them or are they gonna do something because they either feel bad about it or they're going to, um, they're going to again, maybe be punished in some way, right? So that's the guilt component of that is that, um, for example, if, if uh, a child is punished for uh, uh, saying a word in class, all right, that, they're, that we have more of an authoritarian style parent, uh, teacher or somebody in that classroom that punishes them for using a bad word or something. Um, without giving them any kind of meaning behind it. Not, they're not internalizing it. They're externalizing it. So when, when they say something or do something that's inappropriate, they get punished for it. And this is where punishment uh, comes into play as not being an effective teaching tool is all it's doing is stopping it in that moment. What's that child going to do when they're out of eye, uh, visual or eye shot, ear shot of, of that parent or, or teacher? They're going to say or do that action. Right. They're going to say or do that action. They're not taking initiative. They're not owning that. Um, they're doing it because they have to, right? Which is, establishes that kind of that guilt, uh, more that guilt side versus whether they want to do that would be more initiative, right? So taking responsibility. Industry versus inferiority. We see this happen, <coughs> excuse me, right around five to 12 years old. Uh, we see this with uh, school age children. Um, and, and where they have more opportunities to learn. So they gain more skills, right? Or the opposite end of the spectrum is they uh, feel inferior. They don't feel like they're good enough. They're, we usually see this as the development of self-esteem within young uh, children uh, going on to be um, uh, young adolescents, teenagers, right? So do, are, are they uh, capable, like, kind of like we saw with the Reese monkey? Uh, Harlow's monkey. We saw the 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 child or the, the uh, baby monkey. They were more industrious when the mother was around, or the cloth monkey was around, right? Um, versus inferiority, they didn't feel maybe they were good enough. They didn't feel that uh, they feared failure, which was a problem for them. 
or feared danger of some sort, right? So that's the inferior industry versus inferiority, okay? So that moves us into adolescence. Um, oh, I'm sorry. I don't know where we have, I guess we stopped at stage four. My apologies. I'm gonna go through Kohlberg's uh, Oh, we're not going to have time for Kohlberg's today. So identity versus role confusion. Um, as adolescents, you know, we usually see this from about 12 to 17, 18 years old. Okay. Um, so this happens when, when children, uh, or, or I'm sorry, adolescents choose among many values in life. All right. Now, where do we get our values? Where do we get our identity? Where does that come from? Do you think? I think a lot from our parents, uh, but at this this stage, I feel like they start to get, um, go away from their parents mm -hmm. and try to and make up their own identity. Absolutely. Uh, but there's a, a big influence is like in, in school, uh, in sports, if they play sports, any clubs they're in, they're in, um, yeah, things like that. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yep. And, and that's exactly what happens is we see, uh, again, with that attachment, and we're going to kind of, I'm going to use that, that analogy or not the analogy, I'm going to use the, the Reese monkeys experiment, right? If, if we see that secure attachment with the parents, right, they have that tendency to go out and explore a little bit more. They'll meet new people, they'll adopt new values, they'll, uh, but they always have that safety back with that parent when they need it, and when they want it, right? Um, so, uh, the more that they explore, the more they develop that identity and that surety of who they are and what they want, and maybe even where they want to go in life after that, right? Versus a, a child that is insecure and they don't feel like they have that safety and security to return to. Um, sometimes, oftentimes, they develop role confusion where they don't know what they want because they haven't had the opportunity to, to explore. Uh, and I've seen that a lot of times in my practice. So the more confidence that they have, the, the better they are with exploring what their desires are, what relationships they want, uh, and, and that, identif that identity just starts to really build and become secure as to who they are because they're sure of themselves, right? Where, versus role confusion. Somebody uh, might act out. They don't know what they want to do. So they might dress in all black and paint their fingernails and you know, kind of go through that goth phase. Uh, I'm not mentioning any names, me. Uh, might have gone through, right? Um, because they might want to, uh, they, they don't know exactly what they want to do. They, and they kind of just maybe fit in with misfits just to see uh, what their roles are in that constant seeking mode, that constant nurturing mode, uh, and that aha moment of, yeah, this is what I want to be, and this is who I want to be, and this is what I want to do. All right, so that happens in stage five. Um, and we see, in, in, people in role confusion, we see in different ways. They may join gangs, they may get in with wrong crowds, they may experiment a lot with, uh, with drugs and, and people in role confusions oftentimes, unfortunately, get mixed up into addiction, okay, until they have that purpose. And, and I see that a lot with addiction. Usually people with, uh, that, are, that are struggling with addiction struggle with a uh, sense of self purpose, right? And once we have that purpose and that identity, we see addictive behaviors kind of dissolve, right? So anyway, I just wanted to kind of point that out as to my own professional observation with that, okay? Um, all right, and again, I am going to, so adulthood begins in early 20s. I'm gonna fast forward to stage six, which is intimacy versus isolation. So uh, right around 18 years old, um, and really before that, we, we start to explore sexuality we start, you know, identity is a big part of that. Some people uh, determine around that age of identity versus role confusion as to what, uh, what gender they, they might be or what uh, sexual orientation they might have, what, what they prefer. Um, and just to kind of throw uh, a couple of definitions at you. Do, do you all know what the difference is between uh, sex versus gender versus... Um, uh, sexual orientation. 
So what, what, what is sex, first of all? Is it between just male and female? Right. It's what you're born with. We're, we're, uh, most people, 99.9% um, .9 of the world is born of, in, into one of two genders, either uh, male or female. Okay. Um, and, and they stay that way through their, their adulthoods. Now, as they go through those identity versus role confusion stages, they start to identify as whatever it is that they feel that they are, right? If, if, they're, if they have less testosterone, for example, if you have a male with less testosterone, they might identify as, as uh, you know, more of uh, um, woman qualities, female qual uh, qualities. Uh, and similarly, you may have a, a, a female who has more um, testosterone, might, might be attracted to or, or might have more of an identity as more of a male, right? So anyway, we kind of see that on a spectrum, you know, somewhere in between there. And through that, they determine whether or not, uh, you know, what their gender identity is. And we're, this, this is kind of on the cusp of, of recent research that we're um, stumbling upon right now. Now, intimacy versus isolation. Uh, once our, our gender is identified, and, and then we start to learn about what we're attracted to, okay? Uh, what kind of, you know, if it's somebody of the opposite sex, what kind uh, of person, what kind of characteristics are they going to be? Like, for example, if, uh, if a person is uh, attracted to men, you know, do they want the rough, tough, macho men, or do they want uh, somebody that's a little bit more that have more feminine qualities, right? Maybe um, likes to go out and get manicures and pedicures or something like that, right? So uh, anyway, they start to develop a, a, um, an attraction to um, whatever, whatever opposite, whatever partner that they want. And that happens in early adulthood, but that develops into what we call intimacy versus isolation because most people have a desire to be connected with somebody else through an intimate relationship, right? Um, so the primary task in stage six is finding a mate. You know, what are you related? Uh, what do you, uh, what do you value most in a relationship? So they'll start looking at what it means to be in a committed relationship without losing oneself. Right. So what does it mean to share? You know, the better somebody can share and be vulnerable and be themselves with some, with their significant other, um, that develops that intimacy versus somebody that is unsure, you know, kind of go back to that role confusion. If they haven't had the space to explore and they don't know what they want or, or what they're attracted to, that might lead to isolation because we all crave that sharing. We all crave that, that relationship. Um, most people do. I don't want to say all. I don't, I don't like using absolutes all the time, right? So uh, anyway, um, without that sharing, if somebody has a desire to share and they don't feel comfortable meeting somebody that can't, that could put them into that isolation, more along that right side there, the isolation category, okay? All right, stage seven, generativity versus stagnation. So right around middle adulthood, um, you know, we're looking probably around 30s to, to uh, you know, 30s to 50s range, somewhere in there. We say, see creativity and productivity, um, which is uh, nurturing the next generation, right? So what are we giving back? Somebody that might be in stagnation might feel sorry for themselves. They, uh, they're, they're trying to gain wealth, right? As opposed to they're putting all their energy into gaining materialistic things as opposed to um, perpetuating whatever, whatever legacy they may want to leave. So they're uh, somebody that is generativity, you're going to see them uh, volunteering, they're helping other people, they go out of their way for other people without asking for anything in return, uh, or very little in return, right? So they're focused very outward towards other people, whereas somebody in stagnation, stagnation, they're very much inward and self serving. And then that leads us to oops, uh, the eighth theory, which is ego, uh, uh, integrity versus despair. So this happens usually in late adulthood, retirement age, you know, 60s on up, where wisdom, spirituality, and tranquility um, uh, lends itself to the wholeness of oneself, where they either uh, accept their life as it is, or they reject their life as it is. Maybe they have unfinished business or something. If they feel like they haven't done enough and, and they haven't contributed enough 
to others, um, then they might uh, feel despair. And we maybe some of you know somebody like that where they're at the end of life and they're just miserable because they didn't get what they want to do or they feel like they've been slighted through their entire life. Um, th those people tend to be in despair and we usually see them dealing with uh, death and their own demise in a very negative way. Whereas somebody with integrity might understand that this is the end of life and they've done just about all they can do and they've accepted that uh, they, they've accepted their own mortality okay all right so uh, i want to put a pin in this because this could be part of our activity in just a few minutes but um i do want to discuss parenting styles here okay oh geez i'm a little disorganized with with these slides today. Okay, so with parenting styles, parenting styles are really important for a couple of reasons. First of all, they uh, promote uh, uh, that secure attachment with a child, okay? And we know that that's important because we want that child to be free to explore. We want them to uh, feel confident in, in what they do and how they're gonna negotiate all of those challenges that we saw with, uh, with Eric Erickson, right? So to that end, um, it's worth looking at what type of parenting that, that somebody might use to, to raise their children, right? So this has three on here. There are actually four. Um, uh, the first one we'll talk about is authoritarian. So an authoritarian parent is somebody who has high expectations and, and uh, constantly involved, okay? So usually um, an authoritarian parent will direct a child. Um, it's more about the parent's expectations than it is about raising children. So they kind of treat children as, as more of little pawns or workers uh, that are there to suit their needs. Uh, so we see high involvement. We usually see high criticism um, and, and we usually see um, uh, difficulty in, in the child being free to express themselves. What long-term issues do you see with authoritarian types of uh, parenting in, in the children? The children might not know how to like act outside of an authoritarian. Like, what did right. You say? right. We see an identity that is squelched. We see guilt, you know, going back to um, uh, Erickson's eight stages of, of development, psychosocial development. We see guilt up here. We see shame. We might even see mistrust. And they, it, it's not irreparable. I mean, it's something that through even maybe through therapy or some, some I mean, either self-guided uh, visualization or something, that child may be able to overcome authoritarian uh, parenting uh, style. But we know for, for sure uh, that it is not sustainable. It's not something that a child will grow either morally or socially or anything under an authoritarian type of parent. There are a lot of negatives to that, okay? Um, permissive types of parents are, are ones that, uh, uh, that are more interested. And again, this is more about the parent being liked and not having any kind of discomfort or having their child have any kind of discomfort, right? A permissive parent is somebody that just allows the child to do what they want because they want to be, they want the child to like them. It's their impression that the child needs very little as far as structure. Um, they just need to, to be free range and uh, discover what they want. Um, and when that child comes back, they're gonna be happy with the parent. That's kind of the, the illusion that they have. What is the danger of having a permissive style of parenting? What kind of structure? Do you think that child is going to learn from permissive style style of parenting? I think the child is going to want to do whatever they want, and right. you know it's going to end up being where the child is going to end up controlling the parent in the future. Yeah, yeah. Um, not only the parent, but what kind of life les lessons? What kind of structure is that child going to have when they grow up to be an adult? Is that how the world works? Is we say and do what we want, and if we if we can talk to anybody how we want? they're going to probably end up 
I don't want to be like rude, but they kind of would end up sort of in more of a criminal-ish area because mm-hmm. they have the understanding of I get what I want when I want it. Mm-hmm. And so if they want something, they'll just straight out take it and not see any problem with it. Okay. Yeah. And and there might be some truth to that. We we do know that uh, children that can, can that do come from permissive style, like truly permissive style parenting, um, they do have some difficulties holding jobs initially until they resolve that and figure out ways that they can adapt to the environment. Uh, for the most part, we do see permissive children uh, not adapting to work, you know, work ethics, and you know there there are some issues with that. Um, so absolutely. Now, criminal, maybe, you know, it, it, given the right circumstances and the opportunities and maybe how much trouble they got in the past, uh, there might be that uh, that possibility. Usually with authoritarian ch- children from authoritarian parent styles of parenting, we usually see them uh, uh, become rebellious. OK, they become sneaky. They become they don't want to get in trouble. So they develop this secret side of them where they're doing, uh, you know, criminal activity. So usually with the authoritarian, we might see more of an uptick uh, of of criminal behavior and possibly um, incarceration. And then we get to the third type of uh, parenting style, which is authoritative. Now, authoritative has high regard for the child, but it also uh, allows them uh, to have structure. So an authoritative and I know authoritarian and authoritative sound very similar, but authoritative is is allowing the child to be explained why things, uh, why they're doing things, right? There's more communication. There's more of a regard for the child and, and a desire for not only respect for the, the parent, but the parent wants respect for the child too. So uh, we, we see a lot of back and forth communication. We see some understanding, helping the child to learn from each moment and mistake instead of criticizing them or just letting it go, right? This is kind of a really good balance between uh, those two. Okay. So uh, the, the positives with it, again, we see a, usually a secure attachment. We see respect. We see um, uh, mutual respect. We see good communication building. Uh, usually ch- uh, kids that come from authoritative types of, of parenting styles uh, usually are very well-rounded and very well-adjusted and, and willing to explore. Um, and then we have the uh, negligent. Uh, I know it's not on here, but it's worth mentioning the negligent parenting style, which is, or absent, uh, absent parenting style, uh, where the parent is really uh, not interested in the child whatsoever. So there's no learning moments, there's no structures, there's no communication. They're basically just two strangers living in the house um, and, and there's no interest of the child liking the parent. And usually that's the case. Um, so anyway, uh, usually in those cases, we see, again, uh, children, usually in trouble with the law or uh, wind up in juvenile uh, detention or something like that. Not all cases, but, but uh, in, in a lot of them, they, they do. All right. So with that, what I would like to do is uh, if you didn't get a chance, I'm going to bring this back. I would like all of you to, to think of somebody who fits each of these um, stages or maybe have had um, you, you know, just pick a character and on a scale of one to 10 through each of these stages, list what, uh, where you think they lie on it. As far as it, it could be a character from a movie, it could be somebody in real life, um, and maybe your, your childhood hero or a parent or somebody and, and just kind of gauge on a one to 10 through each one of these scales. actually not one. Yeah. Let's do one to 10. Um, uh, what you think they rate on each of these scales. So is that identity versus role confusion, like uh, intimacy, would they be more uh, uh, isolation would be like one, intimacy would be 10. Does that make sense? So we're gonna go from mistrust, like the negative one uh, to uh, would be one to trust being 10. Does that make sense? So the more positive uh, we'll, we'll, we'll rate as 10. Is everybody clear on that? Anybody confused? Yeah, I'm good. Okay. All right. So what I'm going to do is break you off into a couple of rooms here. And uh, let's see, how many do we want to do? Yeah, we'll do 
four per room. So I'll give you guys a chance to get to know each other and talk about it, who your character is going to be and how uh, you would rate them. You ready? All right. Rooms are open. Give you about five minutes. But I, I certainly wanted to just illustrate just how how we can pick up some of these characters and, and what they struggle with through Erickson's psychosocial development. Uh, but you can kind of see each one of those stages. And for somebody that might be a little on the less adaptive or the maladaptive side, we're going to see trust issues. We're going to see role confusion. We're going to see uh, despair. You know, that all kind of leads to despair when they get to uh, their elder, elderly years. And um, you know, which produces a lot of, uh, you know, oftentimes results in mental health issues. Um, so anyway, that's all I have for today. Um, next Tuesday is, uh, so I, I've got, oh, let's 